When people talk about WALL-E as a film, the discussion often leads to weighing the merits of the first half versus the second half. Granted, the quote-unquote first half is only like 35 minutes long, but you know what I mean. It's the debate between the atmospheric, organic, character-driven silent film on Earth versus the densely plotted, synthetic, society-driven satire of the axiom. Tonally, they sometimes feel like two dramatically different films smashed together. One common opinion I hear is that the first half is a masterpiece, and the second half ranges from being not as good but still excellent, all the way down to meh, run-of-the-mill Pixar. To be very upfront right here, I also personally prefer the first half to the second, but that's not really the point. Yes, Wally is a film with a very strong thematic core, thanks to its opener. But what really elevates this film is its application, how deeply it tests and merges these themes into its plot. Wally is a masterclass in carrying out a directive. When you think about the kind of films Pixar usually makes, it's kind of unbelievable they went for this concept and this opener. I remember when I saw the trailer back then, I was seriously questioning if Pixar had finally stepped in it, finally gone a little too far with their quirky ambition. And that was the most wrong I ever was about a trailer. Okay, maybe second most wrong. I think what really works about the first half is that they take this weird concept for an animated film and portray it in quite possibly the most relatable and accessible way possible. They open with a pop culture reference with the soundtrack. They go out of their way to give Wally a lot of personality and human characteristics. They structure the whole thing around a very familiar type of plot, the romantic comedy. We're obviously in a strange setting, but Wally interacts with so much stuff we're familiar with, it immediately teleports us into this time period. I think we're all programmed to project ourselves onto robots and physical objects and stuff. Pixar made this process a lot more organic because they gave Wally a lot of our same problems. Look at this poor guy going to the same job day after day after day. Waking up in the morning all tired, stumbling around, trying to get dressed for work. Going home, collecting a bunch of doodads, and watching some Netflix. He even enjoys being rocked to sleep like a baby. Aww. The film plays it extremely casually with Wally's status as a quote-unquote person. This isn't really a sci-fi example like Blade Runner that openly questions and deconstructs personhood. Do robots actually have self-will? Do they have a soul? This film either doesn't care, or just takes it all as a given. Wally has a personality. He chooses what he can do. He can change his objective at will. Wally is alive. Wally doesn't even have a gender, and I'm still automatically projecting a subjective reading onto him. Calling Wally an it just feels wrong, you know? It's a little like Groundhog Day in that the film doesn't explicitly demonstrate how Wally becomes Wally, how this robot became so darn special. Actually, explaining how this happens is infinitely less fun. It would totally ruin it. We see the giant towers of garbage in his repetitive job, and get the impression that Wally has been gathering objects for a very, very, very long time. We see in this scene how he receives input from the media he experiences, how it gives him ideas, even if he inevitably gets them wrong. We can infer that, little by little, over the course of hundreds of years, Wally has gotten a lot of new ideas. Nothing about his evolution is actually explained, it's all left to our assumptions and imagination. Using Hello Dolly as the baseline for this is absolutely brilliant. Perfect selection right here. Put on your Sunday clothes obviously makes for a great opener with the out there opening line. Really conveys are about to go somewhere and find romance. Just in general, I love that they use the sort of B-tier musical like Hello Dolly. They didn't go for the most famous musical ever, like something like The Sound of Music or Singing in the Rain. I think that would have been distracting. It fits in well with the mundanity of everything Wally collects. He's not filling his bunker with diamonds, Beatles records, and seasons 1 through 8 of The Simpsons. I'm not trying to knock Hello Dolly here, it's a perfectly good musical, but that film was released in December of 1969, after the glory days of the Hollywood musicals. It was big and expensive and way past its prime. What better film to represent humanity right here? It would be like Wally finding a copy of the fourth Pirates of the Caribbean movie. During all this character and atmosphere stuff, they're getting a lot of that world building done too. It's not super subtle or anything, a lot of it is just random video clips that outlines by and large his plan with their luxury cruisers. They show off the myriad of business types that the company has absorbed, that basically Walmart ruined the planet. It's kind of adorable though, given the world we live in now, that it was a physical retailer that took over the world. Hmm. 
The first half of Wally has an excellent sense of pacing, always bringing in a new little wrinkle whenever things are slowing down. We get just enough of Wally toiling alone, just enough world building stuff until Eve shows up. Then we get just enough romantic comedy tropes until Eve shuts down and we get down to business. Don't get me wrong, all these scenes of Wally pursuing Eve are adorable and funny. Definitely a good starting point. I just don't think we need another 10 minutes of it. We've all seen this kind of story before. That extra little wrinkle of the romantic interest suddenly going into a coma is where things get interesting. Now I know this is a film called Wally, but I gotta admit, my favorite character in this has always been Eve. I love what a fireball she is, how frustrated she gets by repeated failures, how goal-oriented she is, how she learns from the world around her. There's an argument here that Eve actually gets the hero's journey in this story, since she is the most pronounced character arc. Wally is the most reliable of all the old reliable characters ever. He barely learns anything. I would argue that Wally is still the quote-unquote protagonist hero, since he journeys somewhere dramatically new, makes the big sacrifices, but Eve definitely gets the most character development over the course of the film. Let's just say they split some of these duties. Eve obviously falls into that character archetype of the hard exterior but soft on the inside. I mean, dang, that's a hard exterior. However, they're really good about showing small glimpses of Eve's more playful side. The way she goes for a whimsical and graceful flight the first time we see her. How she laughs at the cockroach crawling all over her, playing with all the objects while he collects. Eve is very slow in understanding the concept of love, or just holding hands in general. They were smart to play it cool with her in the first half, not getting all warm and fuzzy with a she's being won over glimpse. Ugh, this would be such a worse film if they did that. Eve is still laser focused on her directive. Any change in that is obviously going to take some time. There's a small part of me that wishes this film could have stayed this simple, silent film all the way through. Wondering, do we really have to show the axiom? Do we really have to do wacky robot hijinks? Can't this just be an elegant story of two robots who unexpectedly fall in love on Earth? Less is more, right? I think it was really important for this film to leave Earth and do the second half on the axiom. The film has to expand upon these themes, it has to repeatedly test them. I think without the axiom, one of two problems would happen. One, Wally would run into some of the same issues Toy Story 2 had, where everything is so theoretical, it doesn't know how to test any of their thesis statements and then has to make Wally 2 to settle things. Or two, it would run into some of the problems the good dinosaur had, where the plot is such an open-ended, amorphous blob that some later elements feel underdeveloped and weird. The Axiom brings the human element in the film, adding that human-robot relationship as a point of comparison. There have been plenty of sci-fi stories about robots and the concept of love. There have been plenty of stories about the dangers of consumerism and materialism. Pixar even made some of these. But I think coupling them together is absolutely brilliant. They complement each other so seamlessly. What better way to show off the humanity of a robot than showing actual humanity living as robots? Sure, we could have inferred humanity went down that route during Act 1, but I think it's stronger to let these elements play off of each other directly. It's great how the second half just hits the ground running with this automated sequence. That busy, percussive soundtrack really gets that point across well. We're now living in the world of slick, impersonal efficiency. We're making Wally the fish out of water, which is honestly the better role for him. This environment is a perfect outlet for him to show off how much stuff like Hello Dolly has changed him. A character like Mo doesn't know how to deal with him. Something starts to happen to the other robots. They're forced to go off their prescribed tracks in order to fulfill their directives. This is obviously going to be a huge thing in Act 2. Now, I don't know about anybody else, but I was absolutely shocked the first time we saw the human characters in this film. I slowly put down the jumbo soda into my cup holder. Seriously, I think I drank only a quarter of it. I was so spooked. They really prey upon our worst fears about our self-control. That maybe we really would let ourselves go this much if we could. Maybe we are this suggestible. Maybe we are this complacent and materialistic. These characters spend their lives squawking back and forth every day about pointless stuff, not realizing that they have a pool or could actually, you know, do things. Love how they foreshadow the golf and stuff earlier and then reveal how the robots are doing all the living for them now. They really do hit us over the head with all this stuff, this is easily the least subtle point they make, but it's so darn horrifying and so rife with imagination, it's worth it. 
Every time they show the babies in the nursery, I always wonder how that works on the Axiom. Is it all artificial insemination, frozen eggs? There are many different kinds of robots on that ship. Maybe this is something I don't want to know. Anyway. We also have the ship's captain, played by the ever-lovable Jeff Garland. Now this guy's an interesting one. They initially set him up as being just like everyone else. Look how he can't even reach his own coffee. But he shows a slightly higher degree of self-awareness than everyone else. That he's aware he's a figurehead, and that Otto does everything. But at the very least, wants to deliver the morning announcements. It's great how he grumbles about doing it himself, but still gets everything spelled out phonetically for him. Perfect. They hit upon a nice balance of generalized complacency and giving him that tiny little sprout of assertiveness. We will definitely need that later. There is something that happens during Act 2 regarding Wally and the plant. They sort of merge into being the same philosophical concept. They always did have a lot in common, like how they both clean the earth and are powered by the sun. But in Act 2, Wally basically becomes the plant. In his case, a sort of cultural reminder of what humanity left behind on Earth. The captain starts merging these concepts together. Wally's left behind dirt makes him go down the rabbit hole of discovery, and his Hello Dolly recording reminds him of what he's learned. The plant reminds the captain of the world that they left behind on Earth. Wally reminds him of the humanity they left behind. His enlightenment does feel a teensy bit rushed, how he becomes so incredibly determined to get back to Earth. But I think it's helped along by Wally's other little moments of enlightenment, showing him winning other people over. Maybe we're not giving these humans enough credit once they unplug from the Matrix. Eve really shines during Act 2. We're putting her back in her automated society that she's used to. But that little wrinkle of Wally being around really tests her limits. He makes her break a lot of protocols, gets her in a lot of awkward and touchy situations. Eve is the kind of super goal-oriented character that's fun to mess with. So this stuff really plays to her strengths. They show a lot of patience with her character arc right here. They don't just flip the switch on her suddenly falling in love. The first time we get a tangible hint is when the escape pod blows up, but one could argue that she's also sad about losing her directive. I think we know the real reason why, though. Having Wally actually save the plant, actually caring about her goal, is an exceptionally clever way of bringing these two together. We gotta stay in the mindset of Eve, the goal-oriented character, of course she would be completely overjoyed at this moment, wouldn't you? This is probably a good opportunity to talk about the visuals of the film. I mean, why not now? The defined dancing sequence is absolutely awe-inspiring. I think it's my favorite scene in any Pixar film, honestly. It's just so darn beautiful, the way they gracefully zip through space, the engines with their soft glow, the way the soundtrack swells. I think Wally is Pixar's best directed film, maybe just in front of Ratatouille for me. Even for something in 2008, it still looks great even today. Lots of nice usage of light and shadow, big lonely wide-angle shots, intimate close-ups, color contrast. The character acting is way up there too. You can tell they got a lot of practice from Cars with their eye acting, because Wally and Eve emote exceptionally well, given their limited tools. They still do put one more instance of awkwardness between Wally and Eve, as he gets rebuffed again when trying to hold hands. Let's just say Wally doesn't have a lot of self-awareness when prioritizing what a dangerous situation they're in. They gave us the dancing scene as generalized good feelings, but it's this scene that is the big eureka. They save it for this moment, this moment of Eve feeling something for Wally, not directly related to the plant. This is the right move. I totally buy this transformation now. When the two of them land in the dump, and Eve tosses the plant aside, I have zero objections. She has repeatedly been betrayed by the world of automation. Of course Wally is her directive now. It's a neat way to merge the themes into the goals of the plot. We need to save Wally, we need to get to Earth, we need to get the humans to Earth too. Bingo, bango, boingo. By the way, this does feel like Pixar's first instance of the pit of sadness trope that they seem to love so much. Definitely feels like a precursor to Toy Story 3, Inside Out, and Coco's incarnations. I'm not really in love with their solution of Mo showing up and getting them out of danger. The action is a little anticlimactic. But the emotional stuff works here. Nice repurposing of Eve's scanning ability. Otto serves as our antagonist, if you can really call him an antagonist. There's an argument that Fred Willard is the real villain here, since he sets the automatic protocol. But whatever. Otto's great. A sort of How 9000 for kids. 
The 2001 A Space Odyssey influence is obviously intentional here. They even used the musical sting for goodness sake. I think it was really important for this film to have this struggle between man and machine. We have to convey that humanity is still worth saving, that there's still some fight in them. It's not just Wally and Eve continuing to do everything. At some point, humanity has to want it too. I'm not a huge fan of the moment where the captain says, I don't want to survive, I want to live. The line kind of destroys the subtext of the situation, but I get why they put it in here. Some anvils need to be dropped. Honestly, the escape sequence is probably the weakest part of the film for me. The human sliding downward is a funny visual and all, but you get moments like John and Mary saving a group of babies that feels very tangential to what's really important. This hasn't really been a film about how automation physically destroys humans. It's not like The Terminator, where they're actively murdering us. I don't know how putting them in physical danger actually furthers the themes, other than raising some stakes. I don't really know what they should have done instead, though. They had leaned so much on the robots battling each other, I think they were hesitant to make the climax another big robot showdown. They got kind of stuck finding an obstacle for Wally and Eve, and this one has always felt a little unconvincing. I do love how they gave Mo the honor of finding the plant in the end, however. After chasing down foreign contaminant the entire film, he should be the one to find it. They do really pile on the punishment on poor Wally in the final act. There are definitely shades of a Bug's Life's climax here, just in how much they brutalize our protagonist. While he was already basically dying, they just ramped it up even further. Pretty unusual for this studio. I would argue this is overkill, but I think it's important that they keep portraying Wally as doggedly caring about his original directive. That he still views it as important to Eve, and is willing to sacrifice himself further to get that plant in there. So Wally goes in there too. It's funny, the humans are almost an afterthought in the final act. Which is another reason why they probably put them in danger, now that I think about it. The filmmakers were really wise in understanding that we as the human audience are always going to implicitly care about the fate of humanity. So instead they make the final act about Eve saving Wally. The saving humanity stuff is nice, but almost incidental at this point. It really demonstrates how much Eve has changed as a character over the course of the second half. Since this is a romance, and an animated film, of course True Love's Kiss is going to save the day in the end. Love how quiet this moment is, how intimately it's shot. They take their time with it. We can get quasi-scientific and argue that something got transferred in these sparks between these characters, maybe some cached memory or something. I think that's significantly less fun and would miss the point they're trying to make about Wally. Yes, he's a machine, but it's clear this guy isn't just the sum of his parts. Wally is a film that really captures the simple and elegant love between two characters. That connection felt between people, that magical spark of electricity. There's a real warmth to what would otherwise be a very cold and cynical kind of film. Wally has an excellent sense of temperature, taking us to the coldness of space, the coldness of automation, the coldness of complacency and routine. But that little bit of warmth remains throughout the second half, powering the whole thing. One could describe Wally -E as being a film about how two robots love ends up saving humanity. But one could also describe it as how saving humanity ultimately brings two robots together. I think the easy summation is to say that the two halves of the film bring it balance. But I think that would be selling it short. Sure, from a tonal perspective, you probably do want to inject a bit of wacky and chaotic fun into the script. We want the adventure to have energy, we want it to go places. But I think what really elevates Wally -E to being Pixar's best film is the pure symbiotic nature of the two halves. That the love story informs the automation story, the automation story informs the love story. They're so intimately connected to each other, their themes so layered and merged together. It all kind of feels the same. Otto is basically a bad controlling boyfriend, and humanity should have broken up with him 600 years ago. They took a very personal, intimate story, expanded it to make a point about society, and still made it feel very personal and intimate. Wally -E is Pixar's film with its best sense of directive. Every plot point guides the ship, there are no loose ends. Okay, maybe Bernie is a loose end. And sure, a lot of the themes in this film aren't exactly subtle. It's a family-friendly animated film, after all. It's obviously going to go for very broad appeal. 
But I think there's something to the idea of getting rid of all the extra trappings and getting at the core essence of an idea, showing the audience the core building blocks in all its glory. Pixar is really good at finding that essence, presenting it in such a way where it's accessible to the youngest of viewers, but still holding deep meaning to the entire audience. What is the line between subtlety and accessibility? How dark can a film be? How vulnerable should the characters be? That line is obviously going to be different for every person, and it's fascinating seeing all the small little decisions that they make to address this. Pixar does come off as being overly safe sometimes, a little too worried about losing people, but in every one of their films they still do something that surprises me. I hope Pixar finds ways to keep pushing the envelope narratively, finding elegant ways to challenge its audience, and keeps pursuing the essence of an idea. None of Pixar's films are perfect, but as long as they continue being earnest and thoughtful, I'll keep on seeing them. As always, thanks for watching everyone.